this morning. So Paul's going to start us off this morning. If you would, stand with us. Let's sing together. At this time, kids, if you're helping with singing the songs this morning, you come to the front. Everybody else, take a moment to greet your neighbor this morning.
here. All right, if you would, go ahead and make your way back to your seats and have a seat. And our kids are going to teach us a new song that they've been learning in children's church.
He's coming back again. We believe. Good morning. Morning. Communion is a time each week in which we remember the sacrifice Jesus showed us on the cross. The loving Father sent his Son to earth on a rescue mission, a mission to save us for our sins. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have an everlasting life. As you take the bread, remember his body that was broken. For you, and as you take the juice, remember his blood poured out for our sins. Spend some time now meditating on the love the Father has for his children. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this time of communion. I thank you for your sacrifice you showed us on Calvary's hill. May we never take for granted the forgiveness you have shown us. And may we each day live in your love. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Please be with this offering. Please make it honor you. We love you. Amen. 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 You ever told your kid, don't touch that? That's what I just told Kyle. I said, don't touch that. You know what he did? He messed with it. So I told him that. I had everything right where I wanted. I said, don't touch that. He went over, straightened it up for me. I had it the way I wanted it. You know, sometimes things get messy. And we get around these messes. And Kyle, hey, Kyle, my sound's a little mess up here right now, if you can work with that. All kinds of messes all the time we have. Now, some of you are panicking right now. You're going, oh, no, the kids are going to stay in the service. This could be a mess. Now, if you have a preschool or nursery, uh, we have everything downstairs. There's teachers down there waiting for them so they can go. But the elementary kids are staying in here, Silas. You're staying up here. That's the best part about kids' Sundays. You stay in the church service. You hear the preacher preach. 
It's a good time. And today what we're going to talk about is, is messes, because sometimes life gets messy. All of us have made a mess. We found a mess. We've been a mess. You were at school, and then it happened. Somebody hurled in the hallway. And even after the mess was cleaned up, the, the smell, it stuck around. Everybody remembers that from elementary school, that smell. All families are capable of making messes, aren't they? And royals are no different. And today we're going to back up into the Old Testament. We've been studying the real royal family. Now we're going to go back before the real royal family. We find another royal family that was a complete mess. And maybe this morning this message will speak to you because your life is a mess. I don't know, maybe it's your love life or your parenting is a mess or your career is a mess or the house is a mess and your plans are a mess or maybe it's that you're just annoyed by the messes around you. Uh, your family is a mess, or your friends are a mess, or things at school are a mess, or maybe you turn on the news and all you see is a bunch of messes. Political messes, legislative messes, social messes. And what you need to know, what all of us need to know, is God still works in the midst of the mess. One of the biggest messes we read about in Scripture is in the Old Testament book of Esther. So turn your Bibles to the book of Esther. And this morning I want to share just straight from Scripture about this royal family. I heard this story told to me as a child with cards. And so I'm going to tell the story to you also with cards. And here are the people we're going to meet in today's story. We're going to meet a, a king named Xerxes. And Xerxes, I believe he's a mess. He's got some things in his life that just are, are a mess. We're going to meet Queen Vashti. And Queen Vashti, she's a, a beautiful queen. She's loved by many. But Xerxes' mess affects her, and her life also becomes a mess. We're going to meet also a queen of hearts, and she'll steal your heart. It's the beautiful Queen Esther. And Queen Esther, is, even though she's the key, queen, she finds herself in a mess. We're also going to meet an ace, Mordecai. Now Mordecai, he's troubled by the mess around him, but God uses him as an ace in this story that changes everything. And we're going to meet a joker. We're going to meet a joker of a man named Haman. I'll tell you more about him in just a little bit. This story takes place... More than 400 years before Jesus is born. 485 to 465 B.C. King Xerxes' kingdom at that time was huge. It stretched all the way from the Mediterranean Sea to, to India. So it's a big area. And in the third year of King Xerxes' reign, he's in the midst of this war and he needs to get support for the war that he's in. So he says, you know what will get support? A party. And so he throws a six-month party. He invites everybody else to come and join him. Uh, the neighboring countries and kings, because he needs their support in this war. And he throws this big all-out party, and they were doing things at this party they shouldn't be doing. They were drinking a lot at this party, wine and stuff, and getting drunk. And at the end of 180 days, do you know what King Xerxes did? He said, it's too soon for the party to be over. He extended it another week. So there are 187 days into this party. Now turn with me to Esther chapter 1 verse 10. This is what we say on the seventh day, which is actually the 187th day of this party. King Xerxes, he's in high spirits because of the wine is what scripture says. What's the scripture saying? It says he's drunk. That's what it's saying. He's not half lit. No, he's all the way. And just so you know, kids, drunk always equals messy. Always. So Queen Vashti, she is married to King Xerxes. And Xerxes gives a drunken order. Here's his drunken order. To bring Queen Vashti to him with her royal crown on her head. We're not going to go in detail about that. Your parents can tell you more about that. He wanted all the nobles, all the drunk buddies that were there with him, and all the other men to gaze upon her beauty, and not in a good way, for she is a beautiful woman. But when the king conveyed his order to Queen Vashti, 
She said, no way. Nope. I've had enough of you and your party buddies. No way does this happen. And the king, he burned with anger. Now, he's a drunken, angry mess now. And he gets so mad at Queen Vashti that he banishes her from his kingdom. Nope, you can't, you can't be here anymore. So you're, you're done, Queen Vashti. You can't live in the palace with me. All your royalties are stripped away. And Queen Vashti, all of a sudden, she feels the pain of King Xerxes' mess. Sometimes the mess we have in life is not of any fault of our own. And just like Queen Vashti, perhaps you were dealt a mess and it was of no fault of your own. Maybe you were married to the mess like she was and it took everything away from you through the divorce and it just left you with nothing but a mess and it stinks. And if that's you, I'm sorry, but I want you to also know that God still works in the midst of your mess. Or maybe you're King Xerxes and you don't want to admit it, but you're the one that causes the mess. You're the one that puts the M in the mess. And if that's you, I'm glad you're here because I can tell you, God still works in the mess. Four years passed after King Xerxes and Queen Vashti broke up. And during those four years, he had some hard times. He lost some battles with Greece. Things weren't going well for him. Not only that, he's missing Queen Vashti. And so he's all depressed and he's feeling like a loser, and he's lonely, so his advisors come up with a plan. They say, hey, you know what? We should have a beauty pageant, and we'll get all the beautiful young single ladies, uh, like the show Bachelor. We'll get all the young, beautiful ladies out here, and you will choose the one you like the best, and she will be your wife, and she'll be your queen. Now, there was a man named Mordecai, He had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadasha, also known as Esther. Now, when her father and mother died, Esther's father and mother died, Mordecai adopted Esther to come into his home, and he raised her as his own daughter. So Esther's a beautiful woman, and wouldn't you know, King Xerxes' officials, they invite Esther to be in his beauty pageant. Now, Xerxes' process of choosing a new queen was quite a, a long one. Uh, Before they could even go on a date with the king, there was a one-year process of beauty treatments. One year. Six months of oil treatment, six months of perfume and cosmetics. Guys, you thought your wives took a long time to get ready. It took the ladies a year to get prepared for their date in King Xerxes. So Esther's Jewish is something else we're going to learn about this in Scripture and in Esther chapter 2, verse 10, we learn that Esther had not told anyone of her nationality or her background that she was Jewish. Mordecai had directed her not to do so. So she was quiet about her family heritage that she's Jewish, so nobody knows that. And she goes on her date with the king, and guess what? The king likes her. And she becomes the new queen. Oh, yeah. And it reminds us, though, even though that Queen Esther was... Born into a home that had some trouble, a lot of trouble, in the fact that both of her parents had died before she was an adult. Here God takes the mess that she had in her home and He raises her up and she is crowned a queen. You know, I've found that regardless of the mess that this life throws at us, a crown of righteousness awaits those who trust in Jesus Christ. The prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And this prize is not just for me, but all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, even though life's going to get messy, you can look forward and know that there's a crown of righteousness that awaits those. The moment that we see Jesus, God's grace, crowns you with righteousness. You know, soon after Esther was crowned the queen, the Bible tells us a little more about Mordecai. Let's listen more about Mordecai. Now, Mordecai, remember I called him the ace. This guy played his hand really well. He was definitely an ace. And here's what happened. He heard one day about a plan that some of the officials in the the royal guard had to kill the king. 
And as soon as Mordecai heard the plans of them to assassinate the king, he went and he told Queen Esther. And Queen Esther, in the end, she told the security detail. And when an investigation was made, on Mordecai's story was found to be true. The two men, this gets kind of rough, they were impaled on a sharpened pole. That's how they took care of business then. And it was all recorded in this book of history of King Xerxes' reign. So everything's wrote down, and it's important that you remember that, because we're going to come back to that in a little bit. So Mordecai, he saves the king's life in essence. So sometime after this, King Xerxes needs some help in his kingdom. And he hires a guy, and it's a really bad hire. And his name is Haman. Remember I called Haman the Joker. Now Haman thinks he's funny, but he's not funny at all. In fact, he's just a bigoted jerk joke of a man. And this joker, he's addicted to power. And he's so addicted to power that he passes this law throughout the land that anyone who comes by and passes him or he passes them, they must bow down to him and honor him. And because of his power and because of his position, everybody in the kingdom did so except for one guy, the ace, Mordecai. And the Mordecai wouldn't do it because he's, a faithful Jew, and he's only going to bow to the Lord our God. Now this really, really, really gets the joker Haman upset. You could say it burns his biscuits, and it really fries his circuits, and just furiates him, right? And he sets in his mind, I've got to do something about it. I've got to make an example out of this Mordecai, this, this, this ace Mordecai. He said, in fact, you know, he's not going to disrespect me and live to tell about it. So this is what he decided to do. Look over to Esther chapter 3 verse 6. He decided it was not enough though to lay hands on Mordecai alone. He was going to kill Mordecai. Instead he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews in the entire kingdom of King Xerxes. He's like, I'm going to take them out. Him and his people. You know, Haman reminds me of a Another joker whose name also begins with an H. Evil Hitler who devised a holocaust. That's basically what Haman did. He devised a holocaust. He said there's going to be an extermination day. And to make Haman's holocaust a reality, he goes to the King Xerxes at this, I can't believe King Xerxes just, just fall into it, but here's what he did. He went to him and said, hey, King Xerxes, I'm going to give you a lot of money. Maybe in today's world we say, I'm going to make some campaign contributions, right? I'm going to give you a lot of money. And if you'll just let me go ahead and take care of this evil group within the kingdom, this group called the Jews, we're just going to wipe them out. We're going to kill them all. Because, you know, they don't really belong here. They don't really fit here, King Xerxes. And they don't fit in. They're not our kind. They're not the kind of people we want in our kingdom. So they just need to go. And King Xerxes says, well, you know, if you think that they're causing trouble and they need wiped out, I guess that's okay, but you just keep your dirty money. So Haman, he sets a a day on the calendar when he's going to wipe out all the, the Jewish people. An extermination day. Now, wouldn't this be a mess if you're Jewish? It would And things appeared to be over for the Jews. And we read in Esther chapter 3 verse 13 that dispatches were sent by messengers all throughout the empire giving order that all Jews, young and old, including women and children, must be killed, slaughtered, and annihilated on a single day. And this was scheduled to happen March 7th the next year. So they're saying this is the day when all the Jews are going to go away. And the property of the Jews, to get people to kill the Jews, they said the property of the Jews would belong to whoever killed them. So this is a horrible, evil plot. Now, if you're a Jewish person, you're hearing this, you got to be thinking, God has abandoned me. I mean, where's God in this? We're finished. This mess is it. And that's what most of us would think in this situation. I mean, it's only rational. But what we need to remember is that God will never abandon us. He will never leave us, especially in the mess. He's keeping watch over all of us all the time. All throughout the Bible we read, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. 
Jesus said, be sure of this. I will be with you always to the very end of the age. So even when it appears that this mess we are in is it, and maybe we don't have a mess like people wanting to kill us, but maybe we have a lot of stress or things that worry us. Or maybe we're scared about a class where we say, this mess is it. We need to know that God is with us. He's not abandoned us. And when Mordecai, he heard this terrible news about the extermination day of his people, he, he began to grieve publicly. He was, he was just horrified by it. He was in the streets and clouded, crowded places and he was wailing and he was weeping. And Esther's servants noticed poor Mordecai out there grieving all the time. And they saw his behavior and they didn't really know what was going on. And so they go to Queen Esther and say, hey, I know you and Mordecai are, are close and Mordecai, he's, he's having a hard time. I mean, he's out there in public. He's, he's crying. He's weeping. And he, he's wearing these, these rags for clothes. And he's not bathed in, in a long time. He's getting kind of ripe and stinky. I, I think he's maybe lost his marbles. So Queen Esther, she has no idea about the death day for the Jewish people, for her people. And she sends a servant to figure out what's going on with, with Mordecai. And Mordecai tells the servant everything that's going on and writes a letter back to Queen Esther to tell her everything exactly what's going on and says, you have to go to the king and save your people. You have to go to Queen King Xerxes. Now that sounds like typically, yeah, sure, the wife could go to her husband, but not in this relationship. It's different because the queen couldn't just come to the king. It was all weird. That's all I'm going to say. It was weird. You can ask your parents about it when you get home. It was weird. And there was this thing, unless she was invited to go see the, the king, and the king then extended the royal scepter to her, would she even be welcomed in his presence? In fact, if she went uninvited and the king did not extend his royal scepter, she could be killed. And so she knows that's the deal, and she knows that's the tradition. So she tells Mordecai, hey, you don't understand. Have you forgotten? I just can't go to the king and say, hey, i got to talk to you about this. So if I show up in his presence uninvited, and he doesn't extend the scepter, I'm through. Now look what Mordecai responds with. Esther chapter 4, verse 13. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. So if you don't do what you're supposed to do, don't worry about it, because somebody else will be raised up to do what they should do. But you and your relatives will not make it. They will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. Mordecai is saying, I hear you, cuz, because they were cousins. But, you know, I think God has put you where you're at for this time, for this purpose, to save his chosen people. The ace, Mordecai, is laying it all on the line. He's saying, don't fold, Queen Esther. Play the cards in your hand. We need you. Play the cards that you have. We've all been there in those times, maybe not in this time where it's life and death, but we've been in those times when there's a right thing to do and a wrong thing. Which one are you going to do? The right thing or the wrong time? You know, for such a time as this, moments, it's usually in the midst of a mess. I don't know, maybe you're in college and the professor begins to laugh at a biblical view of creation and laugh at people that believe that God created the heavens and the earth. You're sitting there in the lecture hall. What are you going to do? Are you going to sit there and let him just trash Christianity? Or are you going to stand up for God and say, Well, actually, my God did create the heavens and the earth ex nihilo out of nothing. Or your boss asks you to do something unethical in order to help the financial bottom line for the company. What are you going to do? Or your co-workers mock the morality of a biblical view of marriage of one man and one woman. What are you going to do? I don't know, it's school and it's time for lunch. Are you just going to take your meal and go and dig in? Or are you going to bow your head and have a prayer? This Thursday, October 3rd, is bring your Bible to school day. Are you going to bring your Bible to school? Are you going to hide it at the bottom of your backpack? Or are you going to carry it? 
See, in these moments of truth, it's important. It's important that we honor God. It's important that we take a stand. It's important that we take the cards that God's put in our hand and we we play them the way God has called us to. I mean, Mordecai is saying to Esther, it's no accident that you're in the palace right now. I mean, God didn't put you here in this palace. He didn't take you from an orphan to the first lady just so you could be ordained with all this wonderful jewelry and have an exquisite wardrobe and all these wonderful fragrances. He didn't put you there so you just be an attractive, beautiful, desirable woman. No, Esther, you've been put here by God to save God's people. It's a part of God's plan. Go and talk to the king. And knowing the magnitude of the decision, this is what Esther says. She writes back, Esther 4.16, Go gather together all the Jews of Susha and fast for me, Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. And if I must die, I must die. Understand, this isn't, I'm going to maybe lose a friendship. This isn't, I might, it might cost me my job. This is life or death. And sometimes, perhaps we fold in life because we're, going to face ridicule or embarrassment or lose a friendship or a job. But Queen Esther could be in great danger of losing her life. Yet she steps out in faith and she goes uninvited to King Xerxes. And when King Xerxes sees his beautiful Queen Esther, when he saw Queen Esther standing there, he welcomed her. He extends his royal scepter to her. And he just goes on ahead and say, hey, honey, you ask me anything you want. He knows that she's there to ask for something. Anything you want, even up to half of my kingdom, and it is yours. I think we can take note that when decisions are anointed in prayer, they are favored and they bring about the favored plan of God. It's important we pray about our decisions. We have our friends pray about the decisions we are making. So Esther, she comes to the king and she has a very simple request. She says, hey, how about dinner tonight? Just you and me? You believe this? She's inviting Haman too? And they meet for dinner and the king goes ahead and asks her. He says, well, I know this isn't it. What what is it your request? I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. And she knows that his time isn't right. So she says, well, you know what? How about we have a banquet tomorrow night? Dinner was great tonight, but how about a banquet tomorrow night? Just me and you. What's his name again? Haman. That rotten joker Haman. Why is she inviting Haman to dinner? Well, we're going to see in a moment. Now, Haman, he's excited about this. Are you kidding me? I just had dinner with the king and the queen, and the queen invited me back again tomorrow. And maybe he thought the queen had the hots for him or something. I don't know. He's feeling pretty good about himself. He's on his way home. If he had had a Facebook, he'd have been updating his status and where he had just been. He would have been snapping things, and he would have been tweeting all over the place. Hey, look who I'm hanging with now, the king and the, the queen. But on his way home, he's all happy and just as happy as all could be, he sees somebody. Mordecai. And when Mordecai sees him, he doesn't bow. Oh, are you kidding me? Do you know who I've been dining with? But he restrains himself. And he goes on home and he calls all of his friends together so he can brag about where he's been. I've been to dinner at the palace and I'm going back tomorrow night again. And oh, by the way, I'm in there real tight. And this is what we read in Esther 5.13. Haman says, but all of this is worth nothing as long as I see Mordecai the Jew just sitting there at the palace. Have you ever noticed that it's impossible to enjoy life when you're filled with bitterness and hate? This guy had been dining with the king and the queen. Been like being invited to go have dinner at the White House. 
He's getting to do all the things that people dream about. But he's filled with so much hate for Mordecai that he cannot enjoy the moment of life that he's in. I ask you this morning, are you filled with bitterness and hate? If you are, I pray today that you'll let the light of God's forgiveness shine in your heart. Because I promise you, it is impossible to enjoy the full life that Jesus Christ has for you if you're filled with bitterness and hate. A great vacation will not solve the problem. A new home will not solve the problem. A new purchase down at the car lot will not solve the problem. Because the problem is inside of you. And when we're filled with bitterness and hate, it's like setting ourselves on fire and hoping the smoke bothers everybody else. It just destroys us. It's just destroying Haman. And so he shares with his friends what's going on. His friends have this really terrible advice. They go, oh man, that's ridiculous. I can't believe that. I'll tell you what to do. Let's set up a sharpened pole out here in the yard, okay? 75 feet tall. And in the morning, just go to, to, king, go to the king and tell him that we need to impale Mordecai, the Jew, on the big sharpened pole. That sounds like a good idea, Haman thought. So he ordered immediately that night the, the pole be built and erected out there in his yard. Now back at the palace, as the pole is being structured to kill Mordecai, back at the palace, the king is having a rough night. He can't sleep. And what the king would do whenever he couldn't sleep was kind of like, uh, I guess it would probably work with us with board minutes and, and such, or maybe my sermons. He says, hey, go ahead and just bring the history of the annals of my, of my kingdom and let's, let's read those and surely that will put him to sleep, right? I mean, if we took all the board minutes and had you read them and uh, my sermons combined, you guys would be asleep in like five minutes. <laughs> well, it doesn't work because as they began to read the history of his reign, they all of a sudden get to this part and it's the part where, remember Mordecai going and telling the secret service about the plot to kill the king? And the king, he's wide awake at this point. He says, well, who is this guy that tipped us off? And they say, well, it was, it was Mordecai. He goes, well, what's been done to honor Mordecai? And they go, nothing. <laughs> he goes, something will be done tomorrow to honor him, I'll tell you that. Well, just shortly after that, Haman couldn't wait for the morning. The old joker rose into the palace to get permission to kill who? Mordecai. Well, he walks in and the king sees him and says, Hey, come on in, Haman, come on in. He said, What should I do to honor a man who truly pleases me? And this joker goes, Oh, he's talking about me. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what I would do if I were you. I would take one of your best horses, one of your royal horses, and I would put that person on the back of that royal horse, and I'd have one of your officials to lead that horse around all day long and go ahead and put some of your wardrobe on him. Yeah. Some of those real nice robes, maybe that blue one you've been wearing lately, that's a nice one, all the sparkles on it. I'd put that robe on him, and then I'd have that person led around the city and says, this is what the king will do to a man that pleases him that he wants to honor. The king says, that's a great idea. I tell you what, I need you to go find Mordecai. <laughs> and I need you to, to get my best horse out and go ahead, give him my finest robe, and I need you to put Mordecai on the back of my horse, and I need you to lead him around town and say, this is what the king will do for someone he wants to show honor to. The joker, he leads Mordecai around all day long in the city. This is the man that the king wishes to honor today. The man he's so upset about that won't bow to him. He is defeated. Takes Mordecai home. He goes home. He tells his family, his wife. He opens up, honey, you wouldn't believe the day I've had today. <laughs> and he tells her what's going on. She says, honey, you're through. You're not going to win against this guy. He's going to kill you. <laughs> what? Yeah, you're losing this one, buddy. He was so distraught, he halfway forgot about where he was supposed to be. Where was he supposed to be? The banquet. The banquet. With the king and the queen. Bitterness and hate got him here. The king's servants, the eunuchs, they show up and say, Hey, hey, Haman, we got somewhere you're supposed to be right now. Come on, man. 
You're standing up the king and the queen. And he gets to the palace and the king and the queen, they're already sitting there. And uh, they see the joker walk in. The king asks the queen, Honey, what is it that, that you have you wanted to ask me? And the queen knows this is the time. And she says, If I found favor with the king and if it pleases the queen to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people to be saved. The king is furious. The king says, who would do such a thing like that to my beautiful wife? What are you talking about, Xerxes demanded. Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you, the queen? The wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy, honey. Haman grew pale with fright before the king and the queen. The king jumped to his feet in a rage. He got up all right. He went outside. He was so mad. About that time, as he went out, Haman, he stayed back. He knew Queen Esther was his only chance. And he goes to plead for his life to Queen Esther. She's reclining on the couch. As he goes, he trips or something and he falls right on top of her. About that time, the king's walking back in. Here's Esther laying on... Uh, Haman's laying on top of, of Esther. And here's what the king says. He says, Will he even assault the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? And as soon as the king spoke, as soon as he spoke, his attendants went over and they covered Haman's face, signaling his doom. One of the king's attendants, he watched this all go down. He said, um, O king, Haman just set up a sharpened pole in his own yard. Stands 75 feet tall. It's not being used today. Sure is a shame. He intended to use it on who? On Mordecai. Who saved the king from assassination. The king says, well, impel Haman on it. So not only did Mordecai escape evil Haman's mess, but everything changed for the Jewish people because an ace challenged a queen to go to the king. God works in the mess. After Haman was put to death, he was given, Mordecai was given his job. Queen Esther gave him his house, his whole estate. And God took one of the biggest messes we can ever find in history. You think things are a mess now? (laughs) Read your Bible. God took one of the biggest messes in history. And he worked all of that evil for the good of those who love him. God works in the mess. Some of us look at our lives this morning and we just see a mess. We see mistakes we've made. We see mistakes we've been dealt. We see everything that's went wrong. And we think the deck is just stacked against us and we're just ready to fold. And if that's you this morning, I want to tell you, don't give up. Don't fold. God's not abandoning you. God is at work in the midst of the mess. In fact, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love Him, who are called according to His purpose. And for me, one of the most meaningful parts of this story is when Queen Esther goes to the king on behalf of her people. She's willing to risk her life to save the people. And so she goes to the king on their behalf. And that means so much to me because there's a king A king of all hearts who's went before the people. See, I made a big mess. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's a mess. Sin is. And the wages of my sin is death. That's pretty scary. But the free gift of God is eternal life through King Jesus our Lord. 
Why? Because God demonstrated His own love for us in this and that while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ, the King of all hearts, went and He died for us. Not because of all the good we've done. No. It's by grace we've been saved through faith by believing what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Not as a result of our own work. No, but because of what He has done. Cleaning up our mess. A mess I couldn't clean up. And the Bible says that we confess Jesus as Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead. We're saved. Why are we saved? Because King Jesus, the King of all hearts. And the message this morning is that Jesus wants to be the King of your heart. He was delivered over to death for our sins and He was raised to life for our justification. And if you believe that and not made Jesus the King of your life yet, this morning is the morning to lay your life down before the King. I'm going to pray, and as I pray, I'm going to ask you to stand, and you're invited to respond. Lord, we come to you. We thank you that you love us, that you showed your great love for us, and that Jesus came to us, and you sent him here. You sent him here. And Lord, we thank you so much that you've rescued us, that you've cleaned up our mess, and you forgive us through the sacrifice shown to us on the cross. May we live today in this fullness of life with Jesus being the King of our life, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, directing us every step of the way. Thank you for this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You're invited to come to the front with any decision you have to make Jesus the King and Lord of your life or to make this your church home. Jesus loves me, this I know.
Father God, we come before you and we thank you that you love us. Lord, we thank you for the example that you show for us. And Lord, may we continue to just follow you, to worship you, to honor you in all we do and all we say. Lord, you take us from here and you bless us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great day, friends.